So today, um, as part of our Grounding Faith series, I want to talk to you about community, a huge part uh, in this whole uh, journey of grounding our faith. Uh, allow me to pray and then we'll begin, shall we? Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your wonderful presence as we worship you. And now, Lord, as we listen to your word, may you give us hearts that are open, ears that are tuned in to what your spirit have to say to us. And Lord, I pray that you anoint your servant so that I may deliver your word with clarity, simplicity, but also with authority. So we commit this time of preaching now to you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. You know, we live in a rather strange reality where we have never been more connected, but at the same time, never more isolated than ever before. Isn't that true? We're so connected when it comes to social media, but yet we can be so isolated in terms of relationship. And I think that was the reason why there was an explosion of mental health challenges during the pandemic and beyond. Where, when human connection was reduced to a screen, and I think that was the beginning of lots of things that happened. And why is that so? I've asked myself often, why is that so? I think it's because God has created all of us to be relational beings. How many of you agree? We were created for relationship. Why? Because our God is Trinity. Three in one, one in three. And within the Godhead, relationship exists between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Am I right? And, and I think this is necessary why? Because God, by very definition, must be self, he must be self-sufficient. So my point is this, that God, through his Trinitarian nature, because he's three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he already met the need for relationship within himself. See, and, and I tell you that God was, is never lonely because he's, he's always there with, in, 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 in Trinity. He did not create mankind to meet his need for a family. He did not create us just because he had a need for a relationship. But I think God created mankind only because he derived great pleasure out of relationship. And he wanted more children and he wanted more relationship. And he created all of us in that same image of us always wanting relationship. We were created for relationship. So not your neighbor and said, I'm a creator for you, actually. <laughs> actually, it's true. We were all created for relationship, see? And, and in the same way, all of us have been created to have relationship first with God and then with our physical family, our spiritual family, and then with others. And it's so, so important. Pastor Dan, over the last week, has spoken to us extensively on grounding our faith through our relationship with God, through His Son, Jesus Christ, through prayer, through the Word of God. But this morning, I want to focus on our, how our relationship with one another actually helps to ground our faith. It, it builds things into us that we otherwise would not be able to do. Now, why is community so important? Why, why is community so important for faith? I think this is where I want to turn you now to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, to the Corinthian church that is divided because of carnality. We all know the book of 1 Corinthians deals with that. Because of the carnality in the church, the church was divided. The apostle Paul challenged them to look at themselves through the metaphor of a human body. So he used the human body as a metaphor to describe the church and how interrelated we are. So let me turn you now to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me read for you verses 12 to 14 to launch us off. Listen to what Paul wrote here. He said, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we, are, we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. So one body, many parts. Now, like it or not, brothers and sisters, as believers, we are all part of one body of Christ. 
We may come with different ethnicities, different personalities, different abilities, different cultures, but we are all one in Christ. We are many parts, very diverse, but in the diversity, we are one body. And while our relationship with Christ is personal, I have a personal relationship with God and so do you. It is not private. It is personal, but it is not private. In God's family, all of us here are connected to one another and we belong to one another. And by the way, it's for eternity. Okay, like it or not, we belong to one another for eternity. We are called not just to believe, but we are called to belong. We don't just believe in a creek, but we actually belong to one another. We belong not because we sign up to become a member of the church as an organization, but we become one because of what? First Corinthians 12 tell us only one thing. What makes us one? It is the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. People think that it is by signing up for a membership form that we become a part of the church. No, we don't. It is the, it is the Holy Spirit the same spirit that dwells in all of us that make us one in Christ. It's not your signature on a membership form. It is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that makes us one. And God has made us one in the spirit. And this oneness, however, still needs to be worked out on earth. <laughs> okay, I'm already one with you in the spirit, but we still need to work out our relationship. That's why Leslie Flynn, you know, I, I love this guy. He wrote a book entitled Great Church Fights. And in his book, he's got this poem I always like to quote. The poem goes like this. To dwell above with the saints we love, now that is grace and glory. But to live below with the saints we know, now that's another story. And it's true, right? We are all so connected because we are one in the spirit, but yet we, 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 we can be nice from far, but actually... Far from nice, we all know that, right? And because of that, relationships still need to be worked out. You see, we all know there is a distinct difference between superficial and authentic community. Real community is more than just showing up in a connect group meeting. It's more than chit-chatting over coffee. It is more than having the food after the cell group meeting. But it's all about the IBMs, we call it, right? What are IBMs? Not international business machine. It's in-between meetings, okay? It's the in-between meetings that make us a community. It's about doing life together. That's what makes us a community. See, it is, it's about authentic sharing. It's about practical service to one another. It's about sacrificial giving. It's about unselfish loving of each other. It is about constant encouraging. It's about honest conversations that we can have with one another. That is true fellowship. And that word fellowship in the Greek, koinonia, that is true koinonia. And, and, and I, I think that true fellowship, true koinonia is something that is framed by the Word of God and guided by the Holy Spirit. Not just socializing. It's more than socializing. It's bringing God into the picture. You see, it, in our connect groups, I know that friendship is critical. Friendship is the bedrock upon which we build relational connection. But you have not truly experienced Christian koinonia, Christian fellowship, until we bring Jesus into our conversation. See, and, and until we bring God into our interaction, what we have is friendship. But when we bring God into the picture, when we allow the Word of God to frame everything we do, then it becomes fellowship, koinonia. You see, and Jesus, you know, when we bring Jesus into our conversation, into our sharing, we will leave the connect group edified, built up in Christ. Jesus becomes the answer to our needs. His wisdom now invades our life. His grace becomes our strength. His words become our comfort and His name becomes our strong and mighty fortress that we are run into. And then our joy is made complete in Christ. Are you with me? Yes. It's not just about fellowship. Uh, it's not just about socializing. It's about introducing Jesus into our interaction. And I think that's the kind of community we are seeking to build through our connect groups. Now, 
since we all are one already in the spirit, and since we have a community of people that we do life with, the question now is, how do we cultivate authentic community? The Apostle Paul now goes on to instruct us in 1 Corinthians 12. And I invite you now, go with me to verse 20 to 27. And he gives us a few things here that is important that we bring into our connect groups. So 1 Corinthians 12, verse 20 to 27. Listen to this. As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker, they are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honourable, what do we do? We treat with special honour. And the parts that are unpresentable, they are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honour to the parts that lack it, so that there should be no division in the body, and its parts should have equal concern for each other. So here, here is the Apostle Paul bringing equity into the whole thing. It's about relationships being moderated in such a way that those who already have loss of honour, we don't need to give them special treatment. But those that are lacking in, they become even more indispensable. We lift up those that are down. See, what a beautiful way of looking at, at justice, you know. And then you look at this. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. There's so much to unpack from this passage, but I want to distill everything down to four things, and I'll leave you with these four things. How does community actually build and ground our faith? Number one, it's because it will teach us humility. It will teach us how to be humble, teach us how to recognize that we need one another constantly. Look at what 1 Corinthians 12, verse 21 to 24 says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. But on the contrary, parts of the body that seems to be weaker, they are indispensable. The parts that we think is less honourable, we treat with special honour. Parts that are unpresentable, we treat with special modesty. But our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honour to the parts that lack it. Why? Because a community is a place where believers connect with one another at a soul level. And we spur one another on to deeper relationships with God. And one way that we can spur one another on is to show that we value one another. See, when we value one another, we recognize our need for one another, we spur one another to a deeper relationship with God. We affirm the foundation, the contributions that others can make. And then we give them a platform where they can do it. We give them special roles and responsibilities that will create ownership and as a result, build an environment for growth. Now, I was in a church in Kuching, preaching in Kuching, and they, they put right at the front of their, their ushering team a, a boy with Down syndrome. He was dressed up, you know, in full suit with a tie, full white. And the pastor, the moment I finished service, he wanted to introduce me to this person and said, this is so-and-so, he's very special, and he's here, he's our usher. And the boy was so proud. And I thought about, as I was preparing for this, I was thinking, oh my, that's so beautiful. Because the parts that are less honourable were given special treatment. What an environment for growth. You imagine what that would do for that boy. What do you think? I think it will grow him in no small ways. And we affirm the contribution of every person in the house. Everyone has a part to play. You know, I often say this, right? Those who don't serve, don't grow. That's a fact. Those who don't serve, don't grow. Everybody needs involvement. Now, I know that in the church, there are many Christians who are doing nothing. But I want you to know there is no Christian who has nothing to do. See, it's a fact. You know, every member in the body has a function to perform. And every function in the body has a member to perform it. In fact, the Apostle Paul challenged us to honour the less honourable in our midst. 
Now, there are some in the, in the body of Christ who are so honoured because of their prominence, because of their giftedness and all that, they become Christian celebrities. I don't think that's a healthy thing. I think we need to honour everyone. Some have been put on so high a pedestal that pride could actually slip in, while others are so neglected that rejection can take root. And the truth is this, we were all created in the image of God to be vessels of honour and not shame. All of us are called to honour one another because we need one another constantly. And it's in the, in the body, it's in community that we learn humility and to recognise our need for one another. I have a Melbourne pastor friend who said this once. He wrote me an email and I thought it was so beautiful the way he put it. This is what he wrote in his email. He said, I believe wholeheartedly in teaching our people to honour one another. It's not done by flattery or being yes men, but rather by giving weight to the good and pouring strength into the work of God that we do believe is operating through each one of us. And I like that. It's about giving weight to the good that is happening around us, pouring strength into the work of God that he believes is happening in every one of us. From the youngest to the oldest. And I say amen to that. It teaches us humility. Here's the second thing, is spontaneity. We choose to connect willingly. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 25 says, so that there should be no division in the body, but its parts should have equal concern for each other. It is so beautiful. True fellowship cannot be forced. True fellowship cannot be regimented. It's got to be something that we want to do. We must willingly choose it, willingly choose to relate, willingly embrace community. We intentionally seek out kindred spirits in the Lord, you know, like-minded people. And then we take the risk to share with them about a doubt we are facing, a problem that we are struggling with, or a joy that we are experiencing. And it is through that, that true community is formed. I like a Jewish, uh, there's a, a Swedish saying that goes like this. Shared joy is double joy. Shared sorrow is half a sorrow. It's so beautiful, right? Shared joy is double joy. Shared sorrow is half a sorrow. Uh, imagine if Pastor Dan, uh, I had something very happy and then I shared with Dan, with Dan. Then what happened to Dan? Dan also very happy and then we both walk away happy. So what has happened? Shared joy become double joy. Right? But if I got a problem, then I, I, I come to Sing, Pastor Singya and say, Pastor Singya, I tell you all my problems. Tell, 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 tell. After that, I feel so relieved because I dump half of my problem on him. <laughs> then he walk away now feeling very stressed, but that's good because shared sorrow is half a sorrow. So I, I have half a sorrow now. You get the point? And that's what community is for. We bear one another's burdens. Right? We share one another's joy and shared joy, double joy. Shared sorrow, half a sorrow. Everybody benefit. Nothing so beautiful. As Christians, we go further. We don't just share our sorrow, we don't just share our joy, but we bring Jesus into the situation. And now we are fellowshipping in the Lord. And that's why we want to build a congregation. I've always said this, right? We want to build a congregation with a big church dynamics, but with a small church feel. So that we have one another to share life with. And this is such a need for true fellowship. But the thing is this, we must want to relate. We must initiate connection. So here's my challenge to you. If you're not yet a part of a small group, you're not yet a part of a connect group, I encourage you, go to the connect lounge today after the service and take your next step. Take your next step, get connected, and you will experience what community can be like. See, and spontaneity. We choose to connect willingly. And then here's the third thing. It helps us to build vulnerability. We commit to share honestly. Once you come into a small group, a trusted few people, now you begin to build vulnerability and we commit to share honestly. 1 Corinthians 20, 12 verse 26 says, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices in it. We cannot have authentic fellowship until we are willing to share our lives openly with a few trusted friends. 
then our hidden darkness will, not, will no longer hinder our fellowship. The hidden sins that we, we, we walk in, the, hid, the habits we struggle with, you know, the, the fears that we face, and the, the secrets we harbour inside, if we are able to share it vulnerably with, with a few trusted people, people that we journey together with, these layers in our life can begin to be removed. And then we no longer relate superficially, but we relate deeply. We go through this, sometimes we go through this motion, you know, of relating, but without really connecting. You know what I mean? We just superficially talk to one another about things around us, things about other people and all of that, but we don't really deal with the issues that are in our heart. How do you build deep community? without a few trusted people that we could journey with and begin to unveil and be vulnerable. See, it is like, if not, we all end up like kissing, you know, through a glass panel. So we go through the motion, (laughs) but we never really touch. We never really connect. And in the end, (laughs) what do we have? We just have a good time, drink, eat after the fellowship and go home. You know, and we talk, but superficially. We share, but only on the surface. We speak, but we don't really communicate. We stay in the shadow. Then we go through the motion. We deal with the peripheral, but we never really relate heart to heart. And so we end up addressing symptoms on the outside without really addressing the real issues on the inside. I see our Lord Jesus as a very vulnerable person. And he demonstrated it in one of his most difficult moments on earth. And we all know when that is. We are going to be celebrating it in just a few weeks' time. In Matthew chapter 26, Jesus knew that his time has come for him to go through the hardest thing that any man can experience, the cross of Calvary. So what did he do? He took three of his closest friends, his closest disciples, took them to the Garden of Gethsemane, and there he uncovered his soul before them. Read what he says in Matthew 26, verse 37 and 38. He took Peter and the two sons of Jeopardy, James and John, right, along with him, and he began to be sorrowful, troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here, keep watch with me. What's he doing? I think Jesus in that vulnerable moment is unveiling his heart to his closest disciples. See, and I tell you, even the Son of God himself was not afraid to uncover his need. He was reaching out to his closest friends, asking them for their support, asking them for their prayer. And if the Son of God can uncover and seek help, how much more should you and I? Our Lord Jesus has no layers. He was real, he was authentic, and that is why even children could relate to him. And so must we. See, Once we can uncover and share our lives openly, then we can minister to one another deeply, heart to heart. We must be willing to let God break us down first and then He can build us up. We must be willing to uncover, allow ourselves to be accountable to others. Give permission for others to speak into your life. We exercise transparency and then we can bring our inner struggles into the light. Bring things into the light. And I tell you this, whatever we expose loses its power over us. Whatever we are willing to expose, it loses its power over us. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. Listen to what John wrote here. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light. In other words, we are transparent. We are walking in the light. Okay, if we walk in the light, not in darkness, but we, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship. We have koinonia with one another. And that's when the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. What's the scripture saying? It's saying that if we are walking in the light as Christ is in the light, then we can have true fellowship with one another. If we all walk with things hidden inside, if I'm not willing to uncover anything, then we're not really walking in the light. But if I'm willing to expose, if I'm willing to be vulnerable, I'm willing to be authentic and real with you, that's when we have true fellowship with one another. Are you with me? And then that's when, because I expose it, I'm sharing it with you, I'm bringing it into the light, the blood of Jesus actually cleanses us from all those things that are inside. And it purifies us 
all the intentions of our heart. Okay, 1 John 1, 9 deals with committed sin. 1 John 1, 7 deals with sinful intentions. And many times we have struggles inside. We have temptations we are going through, right? We, we, have, we have things that we, 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 are, we are battling with. We haven't done it yet, but we are battling with it. All the intentions of the heart. If we are willing to expose it, it loses its power over us. If I'm willing to go to pastor and then, you know, I'm, I struggle with this. I, I keep having this, these things that are going on in my life. I feel so tempted to do this, so tempted to do that. The moment I can bring it up, it loses its power over me. But if I don't, I, I quietly keep it and I struggle with it inside. At some point, I'm not going to share with anybody. At some point, I might just yield to it. And then now, it's not just about bring, exposing it. And now it's about having to confess, I've done it already. But the good news is, 1 John 1, 9 says, if I did commit sin, then the blood of Jesus can still cleanse me from all unrighteousness. But why even go there? Why not bring it into the light? Expose it. And then he loses his power over you. See? And this is where Proverbs 28, verse 13, tell us this. Whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses, renounces them, will find mercy. Whatever we bring into the light, whether it's sinful intention or a committed sin, bring it into the light. And then when we have that vulnerability with one another, I tell you, it, would, it is the key to ministering to one another deeply. Why is community so important? Because it helps, it teaches us humility. We recognize we need one another. See, it teaches us spontaneity. So because I want to relate, because I'm made for relationship. So I reach out and I initiate relationship. But thirdly, because it's, it teaches vulnerability. And once we are vulnerable, Sinful intentions have no, loses its power over us because now we have, we have people to share with. See, and I leave you one last thing. It's so important because it helps us build accountability. Why is accountability so important? It's because ultimately we all answer to Christ collectively. We are all accountable to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. We are a part of it. We are connected. We are so connected and we should be accountable to one another. What one part does affects the others. We need to be accountable. See, there, in, there is no discipleship without accountability. Bill Hall, the disciple-making pastor, always said this, if we have not taught obedience and encouraged accountability, we have not discipled. The bridge between beliefs and behavior really is accountability. I can have all kinds of great belief, but if I got no accountability, I may not end up doing it. Accountability is, is the missing link often in disciple making. We need, there is no discipleship without accountability. So what is accountability? If I could give you a working definition, I'll put it this way. It's to be regularly answerable for each of the key areas of our life to qualified people. It's to be regularly answerable for each of the key areas of our life to qualified people. See, in a, in a team, in a connect group, that's where these are people that we know we can trust. And because of that, we are willing to be regularly answerable for key areas of our life to qualify people. And this accountability is always volunteered. It's never imposed. It is only meaningful when, we, when it is regular enough. You see, that's why we say regularly answerable. It's, re it's regular enough for it to be current. Okay? To be, it's still happening. It's about being answerable to another person. And we all need accountability. Now, I know a pastor, a mega church pastor who travels, and when he travels for ministry, he always brings his assistant with him, another brother. And this is his practice. They, they may each have a hotel room, but he always gives his key to the other person. And he tells this other person, his assistant, you can come into my room anytime without asking, without asking permission. 
you can come in anytime. And he's the only person that he will give his key card to. And he can come in anytime. So that I am open. You can come in anytime. There's no, nothing hidden. I'm accountable. Just come anytime you want. And I thought that was beautiful. And that's what accountability is. You know, it's, then this is where accountability is different from counsel. Seeking counsel adds a lot of value, right, to our decision making. It adds a lot of wisdom to our lives. But accountability involves asking hard questions. In counseling, I tell you what I want to tell whenever I want to tell you. But in accountability, the person that you're accountable to can ask you difficult questions anytime, even though it is uncomfortable. That's accountability. We choose to be vulnerable and we seek to be accountable because we recognize we cannot live this Christian life alone. We dare not even trust ourselves. But when we have a trusted community, we create a safe space where we can be mutually accountable to one another, to a few qualified people for key areas of our life. And then as we do that, we practice Galatians 6, verse 1 and 2. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual, then restore him gently. But watch yourself. Watch yourself, because you also may be tempted. So carry each other's burden, and in this way, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. Amen. And those areas, key areas, can include our devotional life. Having someone ask you a difficult question. How are you doing in your devotional life? Our domestic life. How are you doing with your relationship at home? You know, our, our doctrinal life. What do you really believe? Why, is, why are you doing this when you said that you believe that? You know, our diplomatic life. How, how are we relating to other people? Someone must put his finger there. And how are you growing as a person? Your developmental life. See, and 1 Timothy 4 verse 16 says, right? Watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you save both yourself and your hearers. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we all become accountable people. Why? Because collectively, we all have to answer to God one day. That's what Romans 14 verse 12 tells us. So then, each of you will give an account of himself to God. And because we're all accountable to God, ultimately, let's be accountable to one another first. <laughs> Amen. Relationships, community is so important because it teaches us this key, four key things. Humility, spontaneity, vulnerability, and accountability. Let me end with this. What is the best place to experience authentic community? Within our context, I would think it's a connect group. Is that true? It's in our connect groups that we can experience such authentic community. Let me paint a picture for you and then we'll close to this. There's a pastor, true story, who talked about an occasion when a young couple came up to the altar after the service, asked him to pray for their little baby. And when the mother unveiled the blanket, the pastor had a shock because the baby was born deformed and her little face was actually caved in in the middle and it looks really, really bad. And instinctively, without even thinking, when the pastor saw the baby, first thing he said was, oh my. And then he realized that, was, that wasn't nice. Then he said, I'm sorry. And then the mom said this. Mom said, her name is Emily. And we've been told that she has six weeks to live. And we would like you, pastor, to pray for her so that she can know and feel our love. So the pastor took the baby and he prayed for that baby with all of his heart handed the baby back to the mom. Then he asked her, is there anything we can do for you? Any way that we can serve you during this time? And that's when the father spoke up and the father said, Pastor, we are okay. Really, we are. We have been in a loving small group for years. Our group members knew about this pregnancy and they were at our house that night when we learned the news. They were at the hospital when Emily was delivered. They help us to absorb the reality of the whole thing. They even clean our house and they fix our meals when we brought her home. They prayed for us constantly, call us several times every day. 
And now they are even helping us to plan Emily's funeral. And at that point, three couples stepped forward, surrounded Emily and the parents, and one of them said, we have always attended church together as a group. Now, that is a picture I hold for every Connect group in FCC. A group that, that is not just about, let's do this because it's part of the church program. It's not part of the church program. We're an intentional disciple-making church. And we don't make disciples without small groups. I know we can have a small group and don't make disciples, but we cannot make disciples without a community. And it's a community that is vulnerable to one another, a community that is loving one another in a practical ways, a community that is really accountable to each other, a community that cares. And I think that's what connect groups are for. And I tell you, when you have a connect group that is really connected heart to heart, that is experiencing true koinonia, I tell you, it is unstoppable. There is nothing more powerful than a small group when it is working right. And I think this is how authentic community really grounds our faith. And so I challenge you, brothers and sisters, this is my call to action for you this morning. We are an intentional disciple-making church. And community in small group is our key vehicle for disciple-making. So if you're not yet a part of a small group, and you are ready, I want to encourage you, take your next step. I encourage you, go to a Connect Lounge, find a Connect group. We'll be most happy to put you in one where you could really begin to build true koinonia with a few trusted people. And then we take our next step together. Now, I know some of you may have come from Connect groups before and maybe you have been hurt by it. And it's possible because where people come together, we can also not only build one another, sometimes we hurt one another. But if we are able, you know, to forgive, able to release and let go, it actually builds us. And then as a result, we grow in our own discipleship. And we don't give up on communities just because we failed us before. But we say, let's build again. Let's join one and then we build again. And I think God can use all that to actually grow us to become more devoted followers of Jesus Christ. So if you have been hurt in any way, could be in another church, could be in this church, you have been hurt because you belong to a small group and you come out of it with some scars, I say, don't give up on community because community is God-given. But we forgive and then let's do it again. Let's take your next step. And I believe God is here and He can enable you. Let the Holy Spirit, you know, heal, heal you from within. Amen. Why don't we stand together to our feet and city campus, you may do the same. And allow me to pray. Thank you, Lord. Let's take a few moments and would you just take a few moments in the presence of God if you're part of a connect group then let's make fresh commitment to really live out true koinonia within our connect groups let's never let it become just for socialising but it's for fellowship where we introduce the word of God the person of Christ into all of our interaction. If you're not yet in a connect group and you're ready to take the next step, I encourage you to do so. But if you have been hurt before and sometimes the thought of it just bring you the pain, can I invite you this, this morning as I close, would you just take that, take that pain, you take that hurt and you lift it to the Lord. And every head bow, every eyes closed. I don't want anyone to be embarrassed, but would you take that hurt, take that pain, and you bring it to the Lord, and you say, God, I surrender this pain to you. And then you allow me to pray that the Lord will come, touch you, and heal you, 
so that you can do it again and you can reconnect. So if there's something you need to do, can I encourage you? Would you just quietly put, just lift your hearts to the Lord and allow me to pray. Father, you see the hearts and hands lifted before your presence. People that has sought community and has been hurt to that process. But God, we know that you never change. You're still the God who created us for community. And I pray that you come, invade the hearts of my brothers and sisters. Would you touch them where their pain is and remove that? Father, would you remind us again that we were created for community. God, it is through community that we can humbly acknowledge our need of one another, that we can spontaneously choose to relate to one another. God, you taught us, you can teach us how to be vulnerable so that God, we expose things that are inside of our heart so that they lose this power over us and teach us how to be accountable because we know that without accountability, there is no discipleship. So come and do these things in our lives. And Father God, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you come and you teach us how to be a community of people that truly love one another. And we give you all the glory and the praise for this in Jesus' name. Amen.